it's, this is a, a really exciting afternoon. I'm so pleased to be here um, and introduce Lori Piscogato and, and her autobiography this afternoon. Um, so, Lori's life and career has been fascinating and far beyond um, uh, a different experience than the life that I've led in, in ballet studios and stages around the world. And so I think to, for those of you who don't know the very, the details of, of her incredible uh, life and career, I'm just gonna give you some highlights um, to con give context to our conversation. So she's a Washingtonian, she's a uh, Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Vassar University, uh, from the Cum Laude Society. She has a master's from Johns Hopkins School of, for Advanced International Studies. Um, she has served in many local boards and advisory committees. She's an active member of St. Albans Church. Um, she's had an incredible career in cultural and commercial diplomacy. Um, that has involved government service as a civil servant at Voice of America. She's a foreign service officer with the U.S. Information Agency serving the Dominican Republic in Mexico. She was a presidential appointee as Assistant Secretary in Department of Commerce, Dir <laughs> Director of General, yes. <laughs> Director of General for Commercial Service. So not, this is halfway. <laughs> <laughs> communications executive and an advocate for domestic and international clients. She's a former partner at the Livingston Group, a senior executive at Kill and Knowlton and Gray and & Company, and vice, served as vice president of Iridium, which is a global satellite communications company. She's a force, and any of you, most of you who probably know her, um, know that in a variety of ways. Um, but how I have come to know her um, over the past few years is um, really as a friend, as a dancer, um, as a mother, and, and as a grandmother. Um, our, our friendship came over an email correspondence that began in, in 2018. And it was centered on very sensitive topics about um, exclusion of the black dance community at the Washington Ballet and um, how, how to build bridges for those conversations and how to um, understand each other and learn about histories and, and work together in order to make a different future. And I think that through our email, when I, I've been, I read all of them recently no. to, go, to just again sort of look at all of our uh, what we've. What we, we need to publish them, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> what we have um, shared, I think that you, I mean, I hope that you um, saw how important it is to me and really and, and have taken and how seriously I take it um, as, as a dancer and a person and human being and American and, and, and all in all the important ways. And our friend in our friendship she has created a space for grace, which is also you referred to in your book. And um, she's a teacher for me. She's allowed for this um, discussion and dialogue that has has brought growth and also greater insight and understanding for both of us um, based on our diverse uh, professional experiences. So um, I'm just so happy that you're here to share with our community um, more about this incredibly impressive undertaking. I can only imagine um, how the amount of uh, effort it put into producing this book and your publisher is here and so very, very grateful for that. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I'd like to just welcome so, um, as I as I mentioned, we're gonna we're gonna just have some question, uh, dialogue, and then we'll open it up to question and answer, and then we'll have a book signing um, in the in the other room. And so, um, 
we'll, we'll just follow that kind of format. But um, I think when I think about uh, writing a book, that the feeling that comes to mind first is courage. It takes great courage to make yourself vulnerable in this way and uh, to create this window um, into your private life, into triumphs and tragedies, into, um, you know, the human experience. And so, um, what inspired you to write this now at this time? And can you just share a little bit about, about all of that? Sure. I, uh, I'm going to read some passages, so I probably will not be able to do that and hold the mic, but uh, my voice is pretty loud. Um, first, I'd just like to thank you, Julie. Um, our relationship has been very special and continues to be, and it has evolved over several years, and reminds me of being young and having a pen pal. <laughs> now it's all on email and electronic, and we have had a chance to get together many times. And um, probably when you came here, what, five years ago, six years ago, I never would have imagined that I'd be sitting here today with you. And I think this has such symbolic importance uh, because of how dance has evolved in ballet in this city. So I would say that this is a statement, just having us here and having the friendship that we have. So I want to thank you for the family. Um, as for me and why I wrote this book, uh, I will say, and Karen Cox is here over in the corner, raise your hand, Karen, that um, if it weren't for Karen, I probably would not have written this book, because Karen, who um, is my dear friend for many years, we went to Vassar together, she's a fabulous writer, she wrote the foreword in this book, and Karen encouraged me to write my story, oh, for years and years, she badgered me, and I said, Karen, what, you know, why do I want to write my story? A lot of people have stories like mine. And she said, no, nope, yours is pretty unique and you need to tell it. And there are people who will benefit from it. So I started to write when I retired for the first time in 2018 uh, because I had more time. And also because I, I was in a reflective mode. I think when you leave a certain path in life, you think about where you've been, where you're going. So I started writing. I'd actually written a bit before, um, just keeping notes on things. I kept journals from the time I was a little girl and could write. So many journals. And so I went through some of them and I started reflecting on what I wanted to say. And I really thought about it in terms of my children and my grandchildren. And having that information on paper and doing a little research about the background of our family, which is in there, this is a book that is a little different. It also reflected um, the importance of dance in my life. And I started to take ballet when I was five. And I have always taken ballet classes and done some performing throughout my life. I'm now teaching. Uh, I started teaching at the age 14. I was taught to teach ballet by Ms. Jones and Ms. Haywood at Jones and Haywood Ballet School. I started teaching four and five year olds when I was 14. And I also taught at Vassar. I taught Vassar faculty children. And I taught in Mexico. So there are different stages in my life where teaching has been really important and I've enjoyed it. And I also have learned from some of my teachers in this room, some of my ballet teachers who teach here at the Washington Ballet and, and elsewhere, and also from a lot of my friends who've taken class with me over the many years that I've taken class here the last 10 years of Washington Ballet, um, and people from my past um, who, with whom I studied ballet at Jones Haywood and performed with Capitol Ballet, um, who went on to professional careers. Uh, while I only danced for about two years uh, at the uh, Ballet Santo Domingo, and that was as a moonlighter because I was a diplomat during the day. <laughs> and by night, I was taking class, rehearsing, and performing. So I could never give it up. It was in my blood. It really helped to form who I am. And, um, and I think it's important that people understand why ballet, any form of dance, but particularly ballet, because Julie and I are ballet people. <laughs> but I think that ballet as a discipline and as the core and at the beginning of any dance genre is critical. 
um, and it stills in you things that carry over for the rest of your life. So that's kind of the backstory, but I'd like to read a couple of things from the book that explain more articulately than I do just off the cuff um, about why a memoir is important. And Karen actually wrote this in the foreword. Um, and after she wrote the foreword, I was embarrassed to submit the rest of the foreword <laughs> because her writing is just so eloquent. Um, but Karen said in the foreword about this book that memoirs give us the opportunity to give our memories their due, to unpack and sort through the good and the ugly, the sweet and the savory. In doing so, maybe we come to terms with it all and find acceptance. This memoir is a love letter about family and friendship, about love and loss, and about the work needed to keep your sanity when things around you fall apart. At times, it can be easy to push aside our history, to bury the past in small, neat packages, put away and forgotten like ancient history. We file away our memories, joyful and painful, and seldom bring them out to scrutinize and assess. These are reasons, there are reasons for this, some driven by unaddressed anxiety, and some by our need to protect the little bits of joy that appear like the spring flowers on the bushes around our homes. Sometimes, however, in burying those tiny packages, we inadvertently drop one like a seed into soil and give it a moist place to grow. Thank you, Ms. Karen Fox. And so I think that explains why people sometimes write memoirs and why it's important. The other thing that I think is important to understand is why I put this on the cover, why it was important to me. This sculpture, which is really integral to a lot of things in my life and symbolic. I think I bought it back in 2000, I don't know, six or eight, um, from a fabulous African-American artist whose name is Tina Allen, and it's six feet tall. And it's three feet the base, and the actual sculpture is another three feet. And no matter where I am, where I go, that sculpture goes with me to my new home. And, um, and to me, of course, it's a dancer, and um, I don't know who her model was. It reminds me a little bit of Dudley Williams um, in terms of uh, the body, of, of the dancer, and it also um, is balancing on a globe, and my life has been one, really, of travel throughout the world, working and living and, and everywhere, um, and balance is so important to all of us, and I picked this for the cover because of all that it represents. Uh, balance is a critical requirement for success in life and in ballet. A six foot tall sculpture dominates a special place in my home. It's called Eclipse, a tall brine sculpture of a dancer perched atop a large ball. The muscular body is molded into a stylized arabesque, the demi point of the supporting leg balancing on the globe. The three foot tall brine sculpture is mounted on a three foot tall rotating marble base. The late African-American artist Tina Allen created this defining and imposing work. It serves as a constant reminder to me of graceful power and of the strength, delicate precision, and tenuousness of balance.
devotion to something greater than yourself as salvation. Yeah. Um, and I find myself thinking so much about um, the divinity and the work that we do as dancers. Um, and perhaps because it's silent, like prayer. Um, but I would just love to hear from you about how and why ballet has just been, what it has it been that has drawn it, you back to it, whether you're in all aspects of your life. And I think that, you know, although our, our, um, our relationship really started on email, I really felt like when I taught you in ballet class and I saw you as a dancer, I really knew you. Like from then on, I really knew who you were because I, I could see the communication with your body. I saw how you speak to yourself. I saw how you speak to movement. And I feel like for even just for myself, that people that didn't know me as a dancer don't really know who I am. And um, so, I just would love to hear your thoughts a little bit more about the relationship to dance and how, how and why it's just been so important to you. Thank you. Uh, I think that um, those who know Jones Haywood and know Doris Jones and Claire Haywood mm -hmm. will understand this better than others. Um, Doris Jones from Boston wanted to be a ballet dancer, African American woman. I uh, had to go in the, she finally found a white teacher who would teach her ballet. She was, she was a pretty good tap dancer and taught tap, but she really wanted to be a ballet dancer. And she was in Boston, and this is, you know, back in the 30s um, when, when, I mean, back in the 30s, but, I, but we can carry this on for, for many, many decades. But she found a white teacher who would let her come in the back door as the white girls went out the front door and who taught her privately. And she at least developed uh, the basis for ballet and the technique. She met Claire Haywood, who was from Atlanta and was an artist, uh, a painter. They together decided to start a school in Washington, D.C. in 1941. It is still there on the corner of Georgia Avenue and Delafield Place. The 80th anniversary was last year, um, and we still have, I say we because I feel like I will forever be part of that school, and I teach ballet at that school. Um, there are 80 students. Um, this school has survived through 80 years. It has changed the face of ballet in, in D.C. and probably in this country. Uh, when I was a little girl, uh, I started at Jones Haywood. I started ballet in New York when I was five. Um, when we moved to D.C., I went to Jones, Jones Haywood. And those women shaped so many of us. There are thousands <coughs> of former students of Jones Haywood who all feel a bond that will never be broken because of the nature of the training. It was superb training. And I'm glad that when we are in classrooms or in companies around the country, people will walk up to us and say, where were you trained? And when we say Jones Haywood, they said, okay, I get it now. Um, it's wonderful to have that signature on who we are. And it's not just the training we received. It's also the lessons we learned and the discipline that was imposed and the expectations that they had of us. And we knew that we had to always be our stuff that was grabbed and pulled up to your ear. And I'm not saying that all the technique that was used in teaching was the best, because we've learned over time that there are ways to look at different bodies and to make, make adjustments, but they didn't. Um, it was much along the Russian style. George Balanchine adopted them. Balanchine gave some of us in this room a Ford Foundation scholarship through the School of American Ballet. He came and he auditioned us. He sent Arthur Mitchell on a regular basis, who was then performing with the New York City Ballet as the first African American male. Um, he sent Mitchell to our school to check us out every year to see if we deserved another year. 
Um, some of us went to the School of American Ballet in the summer where there were no black students. Uh, there was a relationship that we had, uh, and perhaps the training, as I said, was very much based on the Russian Balanchine style. But uh, surprisingly, George Balanchine is, uh, people don't know a lot of things about him. In 1933, when he came here, he and Lincoln Kirsten wanted to form a ballet company that was half black and half white in 1933. There's a quote in my book um, about that. He also, of course, brought Arthur Mitchell into the company. He also choreographed a gong. The music was playing when he came in. And it was performed in the 50s, Arthur Mitchell and Diana Adams, the first time a black dancer and a white dancer had ever been on stage in America. It was a scandal. People walked out of the theater. He was a trailblazer, and he's seen as someone who only wanted a certain kind of body, and he only wanted, he was a lot more than that. He really did appreciate the identity of a, of a dancer. He liked to see dancers that were a bit different. He liked to see the spunk in them, the desire. And I think when you look at some of the dancers in those times, and Maria, Maria Talchi, the first Native American ballet dancer, guess what, guess what? New York City Ballet and his wife, one of them. <laughs> but, um, but there are so many stories like that that I feel inculcated in me this discipline. And I could not go to ballet unless my grades were great. My father was another real force, and my mother, in the fact that if you don't get all of that at home, you get it at ballet school. So all those things were in me and really made me what I am today. Um, so just digging in a little bit more about um, your experience in Joe Jones Haywood. Um, in the context of Washington, D.C. and um, Washington being a segregated city for, for so long. Um, I, you know, I, we've, we've discussed this, but for me it's, it's so important to look at history, look back and acknowledge and understand um, and recognize the past. And, all the hurt that needs a you know recognition in order for it to heal, right? And um, that that is then integral to us creating the future that we want. So um, unless you look back and understand how can you move forward in, in order to um, to create um, the environment that we want. So can you just share a little bit more about the overall ballet scene in Washington and and um, how it relates to, to the future now, now and what, what, what you hope will be. Thank you. Uh, I try in the memoir to bring a little history forward. Not just history about ballet, but about politics, policy, a lot of things. So there's a lot really wrapped into it, um, reflecting the different periods in my life. When I think about the ballet scene in Washington in the 60s, 70s, um, when I was growing up. <clears throat> it was very, very divided, very separate. The Washington Ballet, which started as the National Ballet, um, Mary Day was the doyen of the school ballet in the city, was a very segregated school. Um, Jones Haywood, that's only 10 minutes from here, through the park, um, was one of, not the only, uh, school run and owned by black women. There were several others at the time. I think what distinguished our school was probably the relationship with Balanchine. Um, we, I remember as a little girl, and I, I don't tell this story very often, but I remember um, as a little girl coming here to audition for the Nutcracker, to the Washington Ballet, to audition. And it was at the old building. And um, 
My dance teachers would have been appalled had they known. <laughs> but my father, who was quite um, a rebel, he was an actor, he was a ranked tennis player, and he worked from nine to five at the Commerce Department and National Oceanic Administration. I think I got kind of all of that energy and interest in both sides of the brain from him. He was determined to expose me um, to everything and to adversity and to challenges. So he took me to that audition. I was the only black child there. I had my little number on, I was lined up. I wasn't bad. Um, I had beautiful legs and feet. I had been trained well. They didn't even look at me. And when I walked out of there, I was devastated as a child. My father was, well, okay, well, I guess you weren't good enough. Because that's who my father was and is. He's 89, still alive. But that experience and also Mary Day of appearing on television in the 70s, must have been around 73, 4, I think it was 60 minutes, and she was asked about blacks in ballet, and she said the black body is not conducive to ballet. And when people like us heard that in the city and knew that this was a rather segregated city, there was the Capitol Ballet, which was formed by Jones, Jones and Haywood, and there was, it was a pre-professional ballet company. It was pretty good. Several of us were in that company and danced in that company for years. And then there was the National Ballet and later the Washington Ballet. Never the twain shall meet. Virginia Johnson, who was in the Washington School of Ballet, came to perform with us at the Capitol Ballet. Um, Dance Theater Harlem dancers came to be guest artists with us. We traveled in the country. We performed at, goodness, I remember performing at Nixon's inaugural. I'm not proud of that. But um, we performed in various venues. We performed at Lisner. Um, Several of us auditioned and were accepted to appear in the opening opera at the Kennedy Center. I performed in Leah Chenchi, um, which was quite an honor. So we were pretty good, but we were not recognized as being good enough. So when the Dance Theater Harlem was formed in 1968 after Martin Luther King died, there was finally a company that was pretty much accepted by some as an acceptable way for black ballet dancers to be accepted and performed. And there were many who still did not accept Dance Theater Harlem as being of the caliber of white ballet companies. So this is the history in this city. And I really turn to you, Julie, and say that you, in five years, have brought things to a very different level of dialogue, of understanding, of inclusion. And um, I, really, I really thank you for that. Because there are people in this room, Monica, who's over at the Arc in, in Southeast, um, directing that part of the Washington Ballet. I see the exchange. I see students from Southeast coming here, which didn't happen before. Um, I see that you are involved with our little group. There are several members of a black ballet teacher group that we formed, the collective. And I see Royce here. And I see Monica and Adrian, and we share information. We bring students from all of our schools together. Julie has taught a master class for our students. Um, there's all kinds of desire to cooperate, to work together, and to heal, to heal the city. Because it has been many decades of separation. Um, and now we're at a place where we can heal, we can come together, we can dance together, we can study together, um, and we can move forward. So I thank you, and I really applaud the Washington Ballet for, for moving us forward. Um, you can't move mountains by yourself, but I, if I'm with you, I think we can move pretty much anything. <laughs> so. I, yeah, I, I really appreciate your trust and partnership in that. Um, there are there, uh, a few other quotes that I just want to uh, bring forward from your book so that when um, you all are reading it that you can um, uh, remember our conversation. Uh, one of my favorites was by 
Einstein that dancers are the athletes of God. Yeah. Oh. Yes. That was <laughs> oh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, I had to include that one. <laughs> but also from Tony Bentley, grace is a consequence of humility. And um, so uh, I think that um, that's another one that is really, really um, spoke to me. Absolutely. Another one, again, is, is discipline is non-negotiable. Right? <laughs> and so talking about um, resilience, uh, resilience and creativity that you talk about in your book, um, compounded with determination and, and in, in one of our email exchanges from over a year ago, um, I, I was sick with COVID and my family was at risk and, um, you know, Lori sent me the most comforting email that just, uh, it was everything that I needed to he hear from a friend and a dancer and um, so it, it was clear the mother and you and uh, was coming <laughs> forward and so I think, you know, when I, when I, um, you, you talk to me about the determination and grace and, and everything that had defined my life so far and to just dig into that and lean into it in order to get through this time and that you would hold my family up in prayer and, and all of, everything that I really need to hear. So can you just talk a little bit about that part of your identity and how the experiences in your life have shaped your parenting and, and um, I know every mother loves to talk about their children, so I'm going to give you that <laughs> space to do that. Okay. Uh, before I jump into that, back to the dancers and the athletes of, the, of, the God, of God, um, part of what I'm doing now and that I believe strongly is that dancers don't get the recognition, they don't get the salary, they don't get the appreciation that athletes get, and dancers are athletes. And um, I put a passage in my book that I think is really important um, about dancers and about the lack of, of being afforded the same uh, opportunities. I'm driven to support dancers who too often are plagued by injury, fatigue, abbreviated careers, or a decision to abandon the spotlight for an alternative career. COVID-19 has devastated many communities, including the dance world. Financial, financial cushion is not in most artists' vocabulary. <laughs> Dancers rarely prioritize, prioritize finances above passion for their art. When facing a debilitating injury, the need or choice to transition from dance to another profession, many struggle to make a living. The younger ones may transform themselves to become competitive in a completely new job market, while the older ones are lucky if they find employment as dance teachers or become an artistic director in a limited number of positions at dance schools and companies. Those of color have been grossly underrepresented in major companies, their associated schools or the executive offices. The rigorous development and performance abilities of dancers have been researched and found to qualify them as master athletes. Is it not time to afford them equivalent compensation, treatment, and recognition? I believe that strongly and in terms of trying to train the next generation, and I just saw Sandra Fortune Green walk, walk in. Um, who is the artistic director of Jones Haywood and also was the first under-recognized black in international competition in Moscow twice and in Varna once. And this is the problem that we have in our country. We do not recognize many of our dancers, ballet dancers, ballet dancers, classical ballet dancers of color for all of their achievements. And I was really touched, and Sandra and Adrian um, were there, when Misty Copeland accepted to come to Jones Haywood a few years ago. She was dancing with ABT, she had rehearsals, 
she came in the snow, Karen went to pick her up, and she came to our studio and she watched our kids perform and she also went upstairs into the living quarters of Jones Haywood and sat with many of us. Um, and we told her our stories about our struggles. And she sat there and listened so patiently and she said, I stand on your shoulders. And tears came to her eyes as she listened to all of the stories of the black ballerinas who a couple of them made it, some of them did. Most of them went to Europe because interestingly, the Europeans were more ex accepting of black ballet dancers. And so I talk about many of those dancers in this book because I think it's important that people know these stories. And that as we explore stories about reality and not revisionist history, that we have to recognize the facts. And as for faith um, in my life and the importance of believing and hoping and feeling a space for grace and forgiving, I think that's essential to all of us. And I know one of my dance teachers would say, um, you know, going to class is like going to church. And there is a dimension of it that is so introspective, that's so personal. When you walk into that ballet class and you take the bar and you go into the center and you work so hard and you're working toward something that is always better than where you started. And I think that kind of introspection and that kind of belief in self and belief in community is something that I don't want to um, be a heretic here, but it is something that reflects a faith, <clears throat> a belief in self. Um, and I have several members of my church, leaders from my church here today from St. Albans, who have helped in that formation that I have, that I've had since I was born um, into an Episcopal family. And I think that religion and faith are essential to who we are. My children, I have three. I raised two from ages 10 and 14, and the youngest, um, Brianna, was born um, of uh, the marriage between me and her father, but I inherited his two children. I consider them mine. They grew up in my home. And um, they are also fabulous. Um, and I don't know how much it has to do with me, because I was traveling a lot, I was working a lot, all over the world, all during my careers, I've traveled at least 50% of the time when I wasn't living in a foreign country. And they are citizens of the world. And they have lived and traveled all over. They are very independent. They all love dance. My grandchildren love dance. Um, and I watch on TikTok as my 42-year-old daughter sends me um, stuff from TikTok with her dancing, imitating, you know, somebody dances and then you do the dance and you put it on TikTok. She says, when are you going to get on TikTok so you can show me and we can dance together? So um, one lives in Scotland, one, uh, one lives in Mozambique, one lives in Angola, and I have five beautiful grandchildren. And I don't see them very often, but we're, we're together in spirit and they share Zooms and photographs with me and they all, whether it's genetic or not, they all have inherited my love of dance. Great. Um, you allowed us all to look inside your heart, your life, your experience, and learn from it. And, and so, how do you recover from that and move, and then move on to to what's next? I haven't gotten any hate mail yet. <laughs> I'm waiting for the first email to come. Why did you do this? That's not true. I try to be very true to uh, my experiences, and I try to be kind. This was not a tell-all. There are many stories I could have told that I didn't. I wanted to be sure that people would read it and not feel that it was an attack, that it was a criticism. 
Um, but I did deal with some tough issues throughout the book um, of racism, of sexism, of um, policies that don't work, um, of um, issues of our time, of police brutality in a way. I tell stories, and I think that there's a lot of reading between the lines in this book, um, which I hope will happen. I also wanted it to be creatively written because I think art and writing is an art. And uh, every chapter has a ballet or dance heading. And every chapter reflects in that uh, chapter, explains why that heading is there. The 540 is a chapter, chapter head, and it talks about the grand leaps of some of the men who have been my mentors in my life. Um, it's, it's, there are just so many. Agon talks about Mitchell. Um, some of the other reverence talks about thank yous and saying thank you to people. Revelations refers to Alvin Ailey's revelations, and it actually includes sheet music from the spirituals that Revelations, each section of Revelations, um, uh, intimates in, in, the, in the piece. And it talks about Revelations in my life. So I think that there are ways to relate reality, um, real world stuff with art, artistry and with dance and with ballet. So um, right now, I did, I'm, I have, I'm retiring, meaning changing my tires. <laughs> and I like that way to talk about retirement. It's a retiring of yourself. And so I'm in the phase of really focusing on art, on social change, on working with institutions, dancers, teachers, all the things that hopefully will have an impact on change in this world and on bringing up the next generation in a way that they can use art as a basis for what they will be, but not necessarily become professional dancers. Just like with me, the discipline, the, crea the creative thinking, the ability to persevere, uh, resilience, hope and aspirations, all of that is taught through dance. And those are all transferable skills. So having people understand how art, whether it's dance, whether it's visual art, whether it's sculpture, whether it's acting, whatever it is, that those creative skills that one develops through studying and performing, because learning to perform is what we do every day. So I really hope that this book and speaking and having people read the book and traveling and the fact that it speaks to so many different issues and appeals hopefully to different audiences, whether you're white, black, old, young, dancer or not, um, I think there's a message for everyone and I would like to be able to talk about those messages and have us engage in dialogue about these things as I'm able to, quote, promote the book. And I said in a post that um, my fabulous photographer and social media guru here, um, Ed Jones, posted the other day, I said, I never, I would never have dreamed that a little girl who started school at PS 140 in Jamaica, Queens, New York, would see her book in the window of Barnes and Noble Fifth Avenue. That's my tra trajectory. That's yours. That's many's. And I really thank you all for being here today. And I think we might have a couple of minutes for some questions. Yeah. Julie? Yeah. Um, this is a, should be a simple question for discussing complex issues, 
except for me, who's baffled by dance steps. There's a photo called Taps for Old Times. Do you tap? <laughs> I, that chapter is called the tap dance, and Kay, Kay here has taught me what I know about tap. But um, we, interestingly, at Jones and Haywood, because Miss Jones was a, a tap teacher and was a great tapper, um, we she would mount sometimes tap um, choreography for us. And I say in that chapter that I really had never studied tap. But it didn't matter because you had to get and put on those tap shoes and get, get up there with people who had studied tap at Jones Haywood. And I said, you know, sometimes you just have to figure out what's the translation from everything that's above and going up in ballet and the groundedness of tap. And um, it's amazing how ballet training can help you no matter what you're doing. Yeah. And so, um, so yes, I actually had to perform. I had to tap. Did I study tap from Miss Jones a few lessons? Um, and had to get up there and do it. So I faked it really well. <laughs> performance, performance. It's all about performance. <laughs> oh, I Lori, I was just wondering, I, when you go to see, you know, Julie's company perform or other ballet performances, do you ever have that pang of, oh, I wish I had stayed with it? Um, um, sure. I, I remember a period of time when, when my youngest was born. Um, I couldn't take class. I was traveling a lot because I take classes all over the world. Um, no matter where I'm traveling, I find a few hours, I do some research, I ask the concierge at the hotel, where's the ballet school? And that's the thing about ballet that's so important to the language of ballet. Once you know the technique, you know the terms, those French terms are used everywhere. So wherever you are, you can go and take a class. And I enjoy that, and I've learned a lot about teaching and everything else from taking those classes. But. Um, I think there was a period of time where I couldn't go. I couldn't go to the theater. I couldn't go to see ballet. And it was a very strange period in my life. I've told Sandra about it. Um, it was too painful. I didn't. I didn't want to sit and watch it. And maybe it was because I knew I couldn't take class and I was too busy. And I'd never had a period in my life where I didn't take class. And that was a period of years when I didn't. And when I wasn't taking class, I couldn't go watch it. <laughs> That's crazy, but there was just something about it that made me feel like, you know, I was out of the whole ability to appreciate it. Um, I, I knew that dance was not a professional option for me. Uh, and those days, uh, Black parents, I think a lot of black parents, looked at black children and saw that there were no opportunities, really, for um, black children to grow up and to really be professional dancers no matter how good they were. And that's why many of them went off to Europe. Um, and some were able to perform in companies here, but always were one of very few. My dad said to me, you are not majoring in dance. <laughs> You are not going to an HBCU either. My parents both graduated from Howard University. Their theory was you must be in a milieu which is similar to what you will have to live. And you will be living in a, majority, a culture of majority white people where you're going to have to succeed. So I don't want to make anything comfortable for you. And that is how I grew up. That was the kind of theory, discipline. Now, is that what everyone should convey to their children? I probably did a little bit too much of it, as my youngest daughter tells me constantly. <laughs> um, but, um, but that's kind of what the thought pattern was for me. And even though I did dance in college, <laughs> um, I took every dance class I could, and I had great dance teachers. Um, even though I did dance in the Dominican Republic. Um, and I danced all through 
uh, high school and came back here to dance at the Capitol Ballet uh, on many occasions from, from college. I knew that, that I had to have other things that I could quote unquote fall back on. And um, I'm glad that dancers today and dancers then even, decided this is what I'm gonna do, no matter what, this is my passion, I can make it, and take those chances or we wouldn't have the opportunity to see such fabulous dancers today if they decided I gotta have something to fall back on. So, I take my hat off to them. Hey, Laurie, at the end of your book, you talk about the collective, right, which was founded in 2019. Could you talk a little bit more about the collective and? To what extent did writing the book inform creating the collective? Mm. I think they were, the book and the collective, the collective was, uh, part of my book is written uh, during COVID, after Black Lives Matter, um, and it was kind of an add-on because I thought that a book should not be published in today without dealing with some of those issues. So the collective was something that happened uh, a couple of years ago, and it probably subconsciously was part of my future path in that I had grown up in the city where you could count the number of black teachers, uh, black schools, or schools that had black ballet teachers and that had black students, you could count them on one hand. There had never been critical mass of black ballet teachers in Washington. And I looked around in 2018 and saw so many fabulous black ballet teachers in this city, and I was just astounded. Look at this, look at all these people. So the thought was, let's bring some of them together because they're people like Sandra Fortune Green who's been teaching for 50 years. There are people um, like Adrian. Um, who was the first black male, black dancer male at the Houston Ballet and who teaches it. Um, there are people like Monica, who is the director of uh, Washington Ballet in uh, Southeast Campus at the Arc. There's Stacy Williams, who danced with several companies, including Dance Theater Harlem who is now at the State Department yes. as an official in public diplomacy. And she is an example of how you can go from career in dance into other areas and be successful and bring that skill set. And she teaches ballet still. There is that Kahina over there? There's Kahina Haynes, who is the unbelievable um, executive director of Dance Institute of Washington. Um, and so all of these people, did I leave anybody out who's here? Oh, oh Royce, God. Royce Zachary, who um, is at Howard University, you. Uh, Department of Dance and teaches here in a lot of places, but is, is bringing up dancers in a university setting, which is really quite different from what the rest of us are doing with younger people. And Duke Ellington School of the Arts, which is training um, performers and artists. So I thought if we could all come together, if we could share experiences. We range in age, and there's Damian Johnson who's not here. We range, we range in age from 20 to, from 20 somethings to 70. And that experience, life experience, and that history, and that ability to share ideas, and to talk about our students, and to bring all of our students never before had students of color from five different schools in the city ever known each other, ever been in the dance studio together, ever had master classes with fabulous teachers. Alicia, Alicia McGrath came down from Juilliard and taught our students, 35 of them who had never been together. That to me is part of the message that we must send. And um, it's not being, um, exclusive or being discriminatory by bringing children of color and teachers of color together. And I know people say, well, why do you only have kids of color? There are a couple of white kids who come to our classes who are in these various schools. Um, however, what's wrong with having people of color come together with students of color? 
to try to share and bring together a sense of confidence and growth. Um, and there is a degree of cultural competence that I believe that comes from teachers of color, teaching students of color, and understanding those communities and those parents and the special uh, nature of being able to speak the language. Um, and it is speaking a language that's a bit different from being in a classroom uh, with majority students. So um, this is the, the philosophy. We're doing a lot of great things. Uh, we're working on a conference that will be on the racialization of ballet uh, with the National Ballet School of Canada. Uh, so going across borders, I think Mahina is teaching students in Uganda <laughs> on Zoom. So it's just <laughs> wonderful to be able to spread this beyond the borders of, of this country and, um, and across the country. So we're excited about it. Uh, it's relatively new and we kept it very small because we want to be able to achieve things as a group. So I applaud all of them who are here. I named, I think, all of them. And I applaud all of you for being here and being interested in the future of our country, of our students, um, and of working together in dialogue to make things. this all possible for us. available to sign, sign the book for you.